All right, so welcome to the next part of our software engineering lecture. Um, today we'll talk about uh, testing in more detail uh, and also about continuous integration. So first of all, let's recap what we already uh, talked about regarding testing. The, the abstract idea behind uh, testing in general is that we have predefined test cases and check whether they produce the right results. Um, however, once again, I'd like to remind you that there is a very important distinction that tests can only show you that uh, an error is present. If your tests pass, that does not mean that no errors are present. This is really important to keep in mind. So. Um, to, to recapitulate, let's say this is the set of all possible input test cases. And uh, of those, we have a subset that somehow caused the system to behave in an unexpected way. Um, and in general, we never are able to test all input uh, cases. Even if our input is just a, a single 32-bit uh, integer, then we already have um, 4 billion possible input values. And this is quite obviously not possible to test them all. Um, and as soon as you have more than, than one parameter or have an array as a parameter, the, the number of possible inputs is uh, so incredibly huge that there is absolutely no conceivable way to actually ever test them all. So we can only ever test a subset of the input test cases. And of that subset, uh, uh, some of them will probably intersect with the uh, with those inputs that cause anomalous behavior, and um, when we run those subset of test cases through our system and observe the outputs, then again a subset of uh, the outputs will actually tell us that the, the system is behaving in an unexpected way, and. This tiny little sliver here, the intersection between the uh, actual output test results, which we generate with our test cases, and those outputs that actually tell us that something went wrong, that small intersection here is all we have to, to basically conclude that an error has actually happened. So um, the big, the, the fundamental idea behind designing test cases is then, of course, that we want to maximize that and want to um, design our test cases in such a way that they are likely to um, to reveal defects in a sense. All right. So um, there's generally two types of tests. On the one hand, we have uh, validation tests. We already talked about this in the very beginning, but it doesn't hurt to, to revisit that briefly. Validation tests um, are designed to yeah, validate the software with respect to its requirements, and they are modeled on, uh, on typical data that the software will encounter in, in its everyday usage. So, um, of course, this also means that the use cases kind of reflect the requirements. And when the software is capable of processing that properly, then it will probably also um, uh, perform well in its everyday usage environment. On the other hand, uh, defect testing has the goal of finding bugs and, and improving the software. And so the test cases for defect testing often contain data that the software will not usually encounter uh, in, in regular usage, but it's data that's intentionally uh, flawed. Um, maybe an empty list, uh, all stuff like that. And we'll come to a couple of examples in a moment. But uh, remember that these two are the, the main um, ideas behind behind uh, software testing. Uh, maybe you also remember the quotes uh, that um, validation testing um, uh, is related to the question, are we building the right product? And defect testing is related to the question, are we building the product right? This is also sometimes called verification testing then. All right. Um, we already had a look at the individual aspects of development testing. Um, and today we'll also look in a bit more detail into the aspects detailed below here, performance testing, user testing, and release testing. Um, 
but first of all let's go back to um, development testing and look in a bit more detail in uh, how we can for example design our test cases so let's say we want to focus on defect testing and the common strategy for designing test cases is so-called partition, partition testing that means we first figure out which uh, subsets of the input data are expected to uh, cause the same behavior. So all inputs from one subset, from one partition uh, of the input data will cause the software to behave in the same way. And then we pick test cases from each of these partitions and especially also at the boundaries between those partitions. I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, this is related to um, path testing and uh, execution paths and also the control flow graph which we discussed in lecture 8 so uh, because every time you have equivalent behavior for a specific set of inputs that means that this set of inputs will cause the code to go through the same execution path um, black box testing isn't really feasible in this case because to know about the behavior and the execution paths you also need to know about how the the code is structured internally um, so this can't really be done uh, with the black box testing approach which is often a good idea but uh, especially if you can't do black box testing maybe simply because of uh, a lack of resources lack of personal then um, it's often a good idea to do this sort of partition testing um, where you try to figure out which um, which inputs should behave in the same way. Uh, another approach to defect testing is uh, just so-called guideline-based testing. So there's a couple of rules of thumb for specific test cases that are known to, to, be, uh, to be an issue quite often. So for example, you can of course, if you have a, a pointer or a reference, then you can just pass in null and see what happens. Um, if your code is written well, then it should be able to deal with this. Uh, if it's not, then it will probably crash somewhere and you have found a bug that, that is, uh, is easily fixable. Um, if you're working with floating point values, uh, then there's all sorts of interesting uh, non-number values. So for example, there's NAN, which stands for not a number. Um, there's uh, the possibility to represent minus zero uh, or infinity. So these are all valid uh, values that you can store in a, in a float or in a double, but um, it's worth testing whether your code can actually properly uh, handle these because sometimes your calculations will be uh, massively off uh, as a result if you put in any of these values. So it's often a good idea to, to test something like that. And if you have integers, then you can just, uh, uh, for example, put in the maximum integer value, the minimum integer value and uh, zero. So this is also very, a uh, very common guideline that you can just put in a, a suitable um, suitable uh, borders basically borders of the or limits of the range that an integer can represent other guidelines relate to uh, sequences or arrays if your uh, code expects those as an input then uh, it's usually uh, also a good defect testing strategy to just put in an empty sequence or a sequence with just one value and also don't use the same length uh, for all tests um, try to use a different length every time and also try to design your test cases so that the code will always have to access uh, maybe the first uh, the middle and the last element of the sequence and once again as you can imagine this isn't really possible with uh, black box testing because to uh, know how the sequences need to be structured to uh, to cause that behavior of course requires you to know the code itself so this is only uh, these guidelines are only applicable for uh, white box testing especially the last one the other ones are also applicable for black box testing and are usually uh, also used in practice because this is actually very simple to design these test cases you just have to um, some testing frameworks actually do these automatically so that they and 
then you can usually spot quite a number of additional errors in your code um, if you just pass in a null pointer. Of course, you can't test in every time for a, a null pointer exception, but in many cases, it might actually make sense to, to do so. All right, so how would that look in practice? Um, let's say we have a function that uh, takes somewhere between four and 10 input values. So it's an array and each value is supposed to be a three digit integer. So it's above 100 and uh, is below or smaller than 999. And so um, the partitions we might want to use um, are probably something like, th th so the partitions this code uh, actually uh, acts the same upon are first of all for the number of um, of values. So we have something between four and ten values that would be uh, a proper input and if we have more than ten or less than four values then it's obviously not. Um, and so for the partitions we can of course pick uh, values that are inside the partitions and we can pick values at and around the boundaries because uh, this is often where, where errors actually happen. Uh, and the same we can do for the actual values. So we can pick uh, maybe also a value from inside the partition here and values at the borders of the partition. And on top of that, we can and should also test with, uh, for example, with uh, an empty sequence with zero elements or with one element and with uh, input values of zero and, uh, and the maximum integer, for example, something like this. So here we have both partition based testing, which is uh, picking input values that uh, are either inside each partition or at the boundaries. And we have the guideline based testing, which uh, tells us that it's often a good idea to also put in zero and one and uh, same for here, even if this is completely outside of the, the acceptable range, then um, putting in zero for specific values might actually trigger different errors than for example, putting in 99, even though they are technically in the same partition. All right, so this was still about development testing. Now let's talk about uh, performance testing. This is uh, specifically something you do with uh, with servers and databases, and it's actually kind of a hybrid in between uh, verification testing and defect testing. Verification testing, because uh, for some kind of a server system, you usually have as part of the requirements some number like the system must be able to serve uh, 1000 re requests per second. And to actually perform the test, then, um, of course, for a verification test, you then send 1000 requests per second to the system and see if it can handle those. And uh, for kind of additional defect testing, you can just exceed that and maybe go to 1500 requests per second and see what happens. So, um, in case, uh, so the, the, the case you actually want is a so-called soft failure. That means that the system will then probably still be able to handle maybe, I don't know, 800 transactions per second um, instead of 1000 or 1500, but it will still continue working. Um, in case of a so-called hard failure, that would mean that the system actually crashes uh, or loses data. And this is of course not what you want. Then you have actually found a defect in that case. So then you mean that means your code um, would need some sort of update, some sort of bug fix uh, so that it doesn't fail hard, but only fail soft in case the, uh, the guaranteed limit of, of performance is exceeded. Um, so yeah, this is something that is especially relevant if you're doing dealing with some kind of backend system, yeah, like a server or database, and it's kind of in between verification and validation testing. All right, another testing strategy um, that's especially prevalent in the security context is called fuzzing, and that means that you intentionally overload. Uh, your your software component that you're testing with uh, with garbage. So 
either similar to performance testing, you just uh, put in a lot more data than the system would would be expected to handle in under normal conditions, or and this is the the core aspect of fuzzing, you intentionally put in malicious data or just random values um, and uh, record that, those values, and then when your system fails uh, under a specific uh, piece of random input, then you can go back into what the, what the fuzzing system actually sent into your code component and uh, check why it, it failed specifically on this sort of random data, even though it's just supposed to, to discard it, for example. Um, there's actually also uh, fuzzing tools available for user interfaces. So on Android, there's a tool that's called Monkey Runner. And the reason why it's called like this is that it basically supposes, supposedly um, simulates a monkey that's randomly tapping around on the on the screen. So it will just um, flood your, your app on the mobile device with random touch events. And that can actually crash uh, or cause to misbehave a surprising number of apps. So if you're curious, then you can test that on your own device sometime. Um, and the end result is of course that uh, you will then have found a bug in that app that might actually uh, worth be worth fixing. Um, if you do fuzzing on some kind of backend system, once again, like a server or a database, then this is often used to, to do penetration testing, security testing, to find issues in the code um, that might be able to, you might be able to actually exploit from outside and that are therefore especially important to fix because uh, it might actually uh, cause people to be able to to abuse your your backend system so fuzzing is often something that's done in a in a security testing context all right um another aspect which we haven't yet talked about a lot and which actually has its completely separate own lecture but which i still would like to mention here briefly is user testing that means that uh, it's not the developers anymore that do the tests, but it's actually the end users. So um, the developers, of course, um, usually uh, supervise those tests, but the actual test itself is performed by somebody who didn't write the software, who is, who is just interacting with it. And so, of course, therefore, the focus isn't on the internals of the code, but rather on the user interface. Of course, if a user uh, finds a bug, during testing, then you should also record it uh, and fix that. But the main focus of user testing is to look whether whatever interface you built is actually usable. And for that reason, it's of course something that's mostly uh, applicable to, uh, to software that actually has a user facing component. So the most simple a uh, way to do user uh, testing is to actually do so-called paper prototypes. And that literally means you don't write any code. You just sketch on a piece of paper with a pen. You sketch something that looks like the user interface might be in the future when you've actually written it. And then you ask some people to act like it's an actual app, for example, and uh, give them a new sheet of paper with a new user interface when they uh, trigger some kind of action. Um, this sounds really uh, a bit like kindergarten, but it's actually quite helpful because uh, then you can already prototype the flow of your, or the general layout of your app uh, without ever having to write a single line of code. You just need a, a couple of sheets of paper and a pen. Um, one stage after that uh, are so-called UI mockups. So you could, for example, piece something together quite quickly using HTML5 or Flash or maybe even PowerPoint and have people click click through that um, to just check whether um, whether the flow also makes sense and it will look a little more like an actual app at that point. Um, if you already have a working prototype, then you can, of course, do a so-called usability study. Um, that means that you have some sort of lab uh, where you set up 
the the uh, software in question then you invite people to come there usually they get a bit of money or just some chocolate uh, as a compensation and then they get a couple of tasks that they have to complete and you just observe and measure how they interact with with your software and if there are any obvious problems um, if you have a more mature software that already has uh, a couple of users then you can also do a so-called in the wild study that means um, for example you uh, ask people to kind of keep a diary um, to record how they use the software um, in everyday life uh, of course you also have to compensate them somehow for their efforts um, and sometimes you can also build some sort of logging capability into the app to see how people are using it in everyday um, yeah, everyday usage and draw conclusions from that. And if you have a, last but not least, there's also a B testing. If you have an especially large user base, so for example, companies like, like Google or Facebook do this regularly. Um, so you can, for example, just make a small update to your user interface, to your web page, and then randomly something like 5% of users are selected that uh, when they visit your web page, then they get the new layout or the new design as opposed to the old one. Um, so it will look a little differently. And if you have large numbers of users like Google or Facebook have, then even with just 5% of people seeing the new version of the layout, you get hundreds of, uh, of thousands of data points um, to compare if the new interface is, is more efficient or uh, people are, are using it for a longer time span or something like that. So this is called A-B testing and that's a, this is something that works especially well if you have large numbers of users, so you can just randomly select a small subset um, to, to test your new uh, prototype. All right, so last but not least, um, another aspect of testing is the uh, release testing, and this is a type of verification test because we want to make sure that the software meets the, the requirements before we actually deliver it to the customer. This is in most cases a black box test because it only relies on the actual requirements and on the specifications or you hand in data for specific use cases that your software is supposed to, to handle and check whether it actually does so. Um, for this reason, it's also sometimes called acceptance testing. So once that test is finished, that means that the customer has accepted the uh, the software and has accepted that it will handle the uh, the scenarios that you have agreed on previously. Um, if you have agile processes where we don't have a strict requirements document, then that of course means it's a bit uh, a bit more difficult to do that. Um, here, this is done after every cycle, after every um, Scrum sprint uh, cycle, for example and it's done by whoever is the de designated product owner um, and even though this isn't something that uh, has a high priority in agile processes you usually need to have at least some kind of documentation um, regarding which test cases were given to the software especially also by the, the customer representative and uh, how it handled them and then for the next sprint cycle you can use those uh, results those um, what you learned from those tests to inform the uh, the kind of informal requirements for the next cycle all right